Okay, uh, DG Real is a very nice project funded by SIA. And today we have the pleasure of hosting Joost Kruijf. Joost Kruijf is a, a researcher. He worked at Buas, he worked at Tier Delft, and he's now doing a lot of jobs when it comes to mobility and urban digital twins. And he's also a good friend of mine. And I saw that he developed a beautiful presentation for today. And we do this in lunch meetings. And we do this to share information with a big group of people on what is actually possible and what is in 50s digital technologies. Um, and we mainly focus on three main topics. The first one is virtual humans. What can you do with them? How do you make them actually useful? The second one is digital social spaces. So think of metaverse type of applications. And how do we meet each other in these environments? Can we use it for good? Can we use it to learn for education, for healthcare maybe? And then it's a very big question always, how do we make this useful? So not only making cool stuff, but something that actually contributes. And digital twins. And digital twins are these data-driven simulation models to get insight in very complex matters. On the right, you see an example of the oceans. Joost will tell you a bit more today about how we do this with cities and mobility. And that is the last slide, actually. So Joost, the floor is yours. I'm very curious what you're cooking for us today. Thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Uh, for the ones who do not know me, my name is Joost de Kruijf. Um, I'm in my work focusing on uh, data-driven cycle policy enhancement. And then at the same time, I'm really uh, involved in uh, digital twins and digital twin development. Uh, today's lunch meeting, uh, I will tell you a bit more about the idea about the digital atlas. Um, it's a digital twin application, and uh, the digital twin application is to evoke a new narrative. Uh, during the talk, I will use some things I encounter in my daily work, uh, applying and developing digital twins. And at the same time, I have, uh, I think, really nice example embedded uh, to explain how I think digital twins can be used in future. Um, so to start off, it's about societal challenges. Um, if you look at the challenges of cities, all cities want to be livable and healthy cities. Um, and they focus on the economic sustainability, the social sustainability and the environmental sustainability. So the three pillars of sustainability. Uh, there's a lot going on in the city. Um, and a lot of people regard the digital twin as the answer to everything. Um, so first uh, theme in the presentation is the digital twin as a buzzword, uh, because I think the digital twin is used more and more um, in policy, uh, but also in all kinds of conversations uh, and things tend to end up as uh, one plate of spaghetti. So uh, at first I want to dive into the buzzword digital twin. Um, the slides I'm using are developed in the Digital Urban Brabant project, which I did together with Nick and Igor Meyer. Um, and the, in the basics, the digital twin is the replication of the real world. Um, so the data and information from the real world are the input for the digital twin. And the outcomes of the digital twin have to feed uh, to enhance the real world. As simple as that, uh, and yet it is quite complicated. Um, why did we start this uh, project? Is to help out the policy makers in the region of North Brabant figuring out what to do with the digital twin in future. Interesting thing is that uh, at first, uh, and I'm not going to tell you everything in detail, but uh, at first uh, the, with the upcoming of uh, digital twins, there was a lot of expectations um, about the, the impact digital twins could have. Um, and as time passes by, uh, the buzzword digital twins and the solution to all uh, decreases. And I think we now come to a, to a point that uh, uh, that we are over the peak that the digital twin is is an ideal situation and now we are trying 
and I think we uh, we and the presentation will uh, reflect this that we are finding ways to use the digital twins uh, to uh, to increase productivity. Uh, there is more to know um, about digital twins and the, the digital urban Brabant project. So uh, I will want to uh, invite everybody to reach out to Igor or either uh, Nick to uh, for sharing the documents and uh, relate to the, the, the content of the study we did. But um, the interesting point is that for a lot of people uh, who want one off answer, uh, they say, OK, the, the, the modeling complexity is hard. Uh, what can we do with the digital twins? It's 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 really expensive. Uh, and the interesting point I always make, if you do not know the value, uh, you can't say it is expensive or not. Uh, but I think people are more and more uh, creating uh, A better insight what can be done and what what can't be done with digital twin um, not to go really in depth on this graph um, there's a lot to say about digital twins um, there is a process and at the end at the right hand side of the graph it says digital twin uh, but before that there is the digital shadow the digital generator and the digital model um, more and more data-driven approaches are being uh, used in policy documents. And the interesting point is that would uh, say that in the past, we didn't use any data or data-driven insights. Uh, that's not a fact. I think we are more and more uh, going to a situation where people can use the data themselves instead of asking someone else to operate it. Um, so this is the urban digital twin pipeline, uh, which comes from a manual flow uh, of data to an automatic flow of data. So um, with this already, uh, this graph gave insights to the policymakers that there is a lot of buzz about digital twins and that there is a, a, a certain amount of maturity working with data uh, from the manual data flow and uh, uh, to really automated data flow. Uh, next slide is uh, related to an initiative. It's a nationwide initiative. It's called Slimme Stad and the Agenda Stad, so the Agenda City uh, to translate it uh, directly. And there are a lot of as well uh, public as private uh, companies who have joined forces to uh, explore more data-driven approaches. Um, so it's not that uh, everybody is finding out how to invent the wheel themselves, but there is also quite some collaboration in the Netherlands already, and also abroad, of course, uh, on data-driven policy announcements in which the data twins uh, take an important role. I already told you that I'm not going really in depth about the digital urban Brabant project. Um, I would really like now to go into the ID behind the Atlas because there is so much, much uh, uh, buzz around digital twins uh, in my role as a program leader on livable cities. I thought there are a lot of concerns and a lot of challenges which we do not know the answer to yet. So what we could use is the digital twin as inspiration. Um, I'm a geographer myself, so uh, I thought about the, the campfire ID because everybody likes to get around, share stories, and it's always interesting because it's changing. So um, uh, we called it the Atlas. The Atlas is uh, something familiar for people. Um, so what we try to do is use the Atlas for other people to get an idea about what could happen and also as an inspiration to start asking questions. Uh, maybe there are a lot of people in the audience who say, yeah, but we are more on the data, data side of digital twins, so about scalability and about uh, reproduction and so on. Um, that's also an important uh, part of digital twins, but the presentation today 
I would like to use uh, for the inspirational and the applicability uh, part. Uh, so the Atlas and one of the uh, respected organization we worked with, uh, say we have an, an interactive, uh, yeah, it's called, it freely translated the peak show, but it's, uh, it's just for people to have a look in. Uh, so the Atlas was uh, uh, more than the interactive map, uh, but as the presentation will show, it's not the digital twin as it is defined in the full functional way. Um, if we then think about the Atlas and the societal challenges, we can build many. So we can uh, uh, focus on the energy uh, challenges, the traffic and transport challenges, which relate to uh, the economical accessibility. Uh, healthcare, education, crowd safety, they're all individual um, topics on which a digital twin can be developed. And over the last couple of years, on each of these themes, we started to develop a digital twin application, um, which led, and this is just a screen uh, dump because all otherwise uh, we should or it too, should uh, would take too much time uh, to uh, to explain everything in detail. But what you now see on the screen are some examples of digital twin applications uh, with some static and some dynamic uh, data involved. So, for example, the top right hand side picture is concerning uh, sustainable uh, logistics or sustainable urban logistics in which uh, a retailer um, uh, brings their goods to the customers and we related it to the vulnerable objects in the city. And that's interesting uh, because with the digital twin, there is the opportunity to combine, for example, private uh, logistic data with all kinds of open public public publicly accessible open data uh, and the combination of both makes it really interesting. So for example, the, the picture in the middle is, uh, is uh, concerning all the flows uh, which uh, go to the city center of Rotterdam. Uh, so it's a more an origin destination analysis of all the, uh, all the customers or, or all the visitors and the picture on the right next to it uh, is a dynamic uh, dynamic visitors uh, uh, analysis, uh, which we have developed over the years. So for each of the pictures, it is possible to explain what the ID uh, is behind it. Uh, so it goes from bike, uh, bike flows to uh, private logistic flows to, and for example, also, the built environment of uh, business parks, which is visualized on the bottom right hand side of the screen. Going to the uh, picture which I showed you earlier um, from the logistics community Brabant, we uh, started to develop uh, such uh, interesting insights together with uh, Breda University of Applied Sciences and also uh, uh, knowledge from, for example, Technical University of uh, of Delft and collaborating with Eindhoven, I encountered uh, this guy. It's a, it's a researcher on information systems from Technical University Eindhoven, and he was the first to tell me, "Yes, yo, you have a really great uh, application uh, being developed, but it's a digital shadow." And at first, I did not really know what to react uh, because I thought. I'm using a digital twin and then uh, Abdo, uh, as he is uh, uh, named, he said, no, you have a digital shadow because you put a lot of data in, uh, but nothing in practice is directly uh, changing due to the digital twin. So um, this was the first time for me and I was already working uh, with, uh, with something like a digital twin for uh, some time. So. Um, I think most of the examples I explain are digital shadow applications, but the interesting thing is that they are moving to a digital twin. Um, and what 
what is interesting, and this uh, guy I have to introduce to, this is Jesse Donkers. He is a student, master student of the Technical University of Eindhoven, with which I, and I uh, have to apologize for the uh, Dutch term on the sheet. Uh, it's a sustainable urban logistics, because with Jesse, we developed a fully new uh, algorithm to determine sustainable uh, logistics in the city and the sustainable logistic uh, routing uh, in a city. So with Jesse, we made the first attempt to do something about scenario modeling in the digital twin. And the, the nice thing to be able to present is that what we developed with this study uh, together uh, is now um, incorporated in the DMI ecosystem. And for the people who are not so involved in the mobility uh, related uh, digital twin applications or the mobility related issues, the DMI is the Dutch Metropolitan Innovations Ecosystem. Uh, and it's a really big program in the Netherlands um, concerning the data scaling and the uh, reproduction. Uh, and in that program, there are many, many policy makers involved trying to find new answers and insights to uh, existing challenges. So with, uh, with the study Jesse uh, did from TU Eindhoven, I think we did a first really great attempt to uh, do scenario modeling in the digital twin. And um, as everything goes like planned, this uh, uh, algorithm being developed as a student project will be incorporated in the DMI ecosystem on short notice. So that's a really nice thing because the discussion about digital shadow and what is the next step to digital twin, uh, I think we did uh, quite some good work in the right direction. Uh, one other thing I would like to present is the speed of digital twin development for the people who are not so familiar with uh, or Royals, uh, this is our queen on King's Day of last year in Rotterdam. Um, and the interesting part is, and I will show you a, a, a movie in short, but uh, the interesting part is that there has to be for a digital twin an interaction between the real life and the uh, digital twin. So um, I'm going to present a short movie which has been developed. Uh, to explain how the digital twin is being used in the case of uh, The Hague uh, and Scheveningen, which is one of our most popular beaches in the Netherlands, uh, so, uh, with the interaction between the digital twin application and the real life challenges. We need to be there to uh, ensure uh, the. The Schevening area is a beach near the city of The Hague. Every year, 50 million people visit the beach to go to the restaurants, visit the hotel, or simply lie on the beach and enjoy the atmosphere. In order to get all those people in and out, it's a very complex operation. And to gain better insight in all the crowd flows in and around the area, we developed a digital dashboard called the Digital Twin that provides the right information on the right time to make decisions on the crowd flows in the city. In the digital twin, we connected a lot of data sources, for instance, traffic, public transport, and crowd counting of cameras, but also, for instance, the weather. And as we connected them to one integrated dashboard, everybody could have the right information to make the right decisions at the right time. This dashboard gave very important information about forecasting because we developed forecasting models which gave us the information on how crowded it was going to be for instance in a few hours so with that information you could make the right decision at the right time in order to ensure uh, a good experience but also a safe experience on the beach this location is very special for about two reasons the first reason is the variety of people visiting the beach. It involves families with little kids, but it also involves a large group of young people wanting to party at the beach. So it's a very mixed uh, group of visitors. The second reason why the location is so special is because of the traffic jams. If you want to 
reach the boulevard of Schäfling by car, you uh, in fact entering a sort of trap. And when it's very crowded, there are large traffic jams and you can escape from that. You cannot turn around. So we as a municipality have to think about how to redirect those traffic jams. And the uh, dashboard of the crowd safety manager is very helpful uh, in this. We as police officers, we need data to do our work properly. Uh, when it's crowded in the coastal area, uh, we need to be there to uh, ensure uh, the safety for all the, the visitors here. So uh, we want to be there when it's crowded and we don't want to be here when it's not crowded because our presentation can affect the mood of the people over here. We as police officers are not the only one who's responsible for the safety of the crowd. So you want to have the same picture with all the other stakeholders. Uh, we call it a common operational picture. And with Crowd Safety Manager, we all have the same data, so uh, we can make a decision with all the stakeholders with the right information. One of the big advantages of working with the Crowd Safety Manager, with the dashboard of the Crowd Safety Manager, is that all organizations involved, like the police department, are working with the same dashboard, so we have the same common operational picture. It's also important to stress that uh, all data that is being used in the dashboard is anonymized, so the privacy of all the visitors is guaranteed. With this system, we did not only provide the right information at the right time by providing forecasting models, etc., but we also created one integrated view for all the stakeholders to have the same information. So they could make decisions together. And this eventually led to a better cooperation between the police and the city in order to eventually create a better experience and a safer Schevening area. We need to be there. Okay, there is a lot uh, being said in the movie just showed. Um, and one of the interesting things is this, that uh, in the livable city discussion and the crowd safety uh, discussion, uh, we also started developing a digital twin and uh, because of the urgency, the city of The Hague uh, with the National Police took over. So um, it's interesting how to develop digital twins, uh, because sometimes they are developed from an academic perspective or a scientific perspective. Uh, and sometimes uh, because of the, so to say, societal urge, uh, these uh, models are being taken over. Um, and that's why uh, it makes the working and the development of digital twins quite complex and re and at the same time really interesting. So uh, the next theme I want to um, dive into is the triple triple helix digital twins. And for the people who are not so uh, familiar with triple helix, uh, it's uh, we use that term quite often to. Uh, to focus on the relation between uh, the policy uh, practice, so the the, uh, the the entrepreneurs and the knowledge institutes. Uh, and the example I'm going to shortly tell you about is the accessibility of the railway station in Tilburg. Uh, because one of the things we developed from the Breda University of Applied Sciences uh, was the accessibility of the uh, the railway station uh, in Tilburg using GPS data to uh, use empirical data on accessibility. So we were really proud to be able to present this map. Uh, and the reactions were really positive because people like the map. It's quite uh, interesting what the map says because the greener uh, the, the color on the map, uh, the better accessible it is by bike. and um, so we gave quite a good insight in the accessibility of the one of the most important uh, sub-destinations of the city. 
So at first we were really happy to uh, be able to show the map. And then um, we, uh, we did some more research about the, the likelihood of people using the bike to go to the public transport. So then we said, okay, we now have a nice map. And because we have also understanding about uh, behavioral uh, uh, intention and behavioral uh, likelihood, uh, we can also give some more um, advice or insights to the city what, for example, uh, an increase or a decrease actually of travel time would lead to more people using the bike to enter the railway station. Um, so gradually we develop more insights uh, and then, and I'm going to use the example of the ASML bike parking, uh, one of the biggest companies in the regions. Uh, in the region knocked on the door and said, yeah, can you please help us out? Because you uh, apparently have quite some knowledge about uh, cycling accessibility and we have a challenge uh, for sustainable transport where the bike is a really important asset. Um, so we got in conversation and Asmel said, yeah, we have uh, uh, some access and mobility uh, measures. Uh, so for people, living in the distance of 10 kilometers from ASML, we have a cycling commuting uh, program. Um, so with an average of uh, 15 kilometers an hour, it's uh, more or less 40 minutes of cycling time uh, to be the boundary of the cycle, uh, cycle accessibility measures. Um, so then we told uh, ASML, yeah, that's interesting. So uh, once more, the figure I already presented, uh, the likelihood of people using the bike to work. So um, uh, not to go in detail on this graph, but uh, it says the amount of um, employees uh, related to, to the cycle time from the company. So the further we go right on the XX, uh, the more employees are accessible uh, because there is a likelihood of people not willing to take the bike if it takes too long. Uh, the amount of cyclists uh, we could expect in the bicycle parking is far less than uh, expected from only the, uh, the rule of thumb that the 10 kilometer um, boundary is one to use. So we show this to ASML um, to say, okay, um, to follow the yellowish line on the 20 minute uh, travel time by bike, uh, you could expect uh, 2,500 employees to take the bike. Uh, but if you then related to the likelihood of cycling, you only can expect 1,200, 1,300 cyclists each day in the bike park. So ASML was really uh, interested in these figures and they say, okay, but that, then with this, and of course, with some more insights, uh, we can build better access and mobility measures. Um, why I told uh, we have to focus on triple helix uh, digital twin development. Um, the uh, cycling is uh, being influenced by the bikes the cyclists and the bike path. And what we told ASML is we also know what the plans are of the community investing in cycle infrastructure. So what we can do, and that is the map I just clicked on the screen, is the accessibility gain with all the investments in the network uh, in the region of Eindhoven. So we can, for each employee, show what the travel time gain is um, as a result of the investment in the cycle path. And that's interesting because we then know how many people have uh, a positive effect of all the investments. What we then did is say, okay, uh, with the upcoming uh, advantages of the e-bike, we can also uh, build a curve with the likelihood of people using the e-bike and that map is a bit different than the map showed earlier. And what we then did is say, okay, but for the people, for example, living on a 20 minutes uh, travel from ASML, and we are able to push it to a uh, travel time gain, gain 
of five minutes. So instead of 20 minutes, they only have to cycle for 15 minutes. Uh, the likelihood of cycling increases from 20 of uh, 42 to 59%. And that's massive because then uh, the e-bike in combination with the investments of the government uh, massively increases the chances of cycling. Um, so, and this is only uh, uh, partly, maybe it's still a digital shadow, uh, but it's also embedding scenario so we could say we are moving to the digital twin uh, with data from private companies and data uh, um, from the policy makers we are able to establish new insights and if we then say okay but this is a really really regional uh, challenge uh, i can say it's not because uh, uh, dutch governments have joined forces and the map i just Additionally, showed is the uh, the investments which is planned for high quality large cycling infrastructure in the Netherlands. So, for almost each company in the Netherlands in the urban regions, these kinds of models have added value. So, with that, so adding the plans of the government with uh, the data from private companies enlarges the um, the perspective of all. Lastly, I think um, I think we could say uh, that we are a bit lost in the digital twins translation. Um, and the thing is that I encounter many people in daily life um, who are working with digital twins. And as I already mentioned before, um, there is a lot to do about digital twins. So there are a lot of people involved in the data part of digital twins, so arranging data, uh, building APIs, um, and at the same time, the front end has to be really uh, intuitive for people to be able to use them. So uh, uh, there are some people at the front end, some at the back end, and then again, it's also interesting, and that's more my focus on work, uh, translating the question into uh, valuable insights. So there are a lot of people involved in the digital twin world. And a lot of people say, I know everything about the digital twin and I really would like to challenge them because the digital twin field and the digital twin uh, processes in this phase that there are a lot of people knowing some about the digital twin and not all. Uh, and as an example for uh, to help out, uh, there are, and it's only two examples um, which are now really relevant uh, one is a really big uh, scientific research in which a lot of stakeholders take uh, take part in uh, it's the ie compass uh, and it's about uh, the the application of artificial intelligence uh, and the relation to digital twins and one of the programs i developed myself is the dutch metropolitan cycling innovations program which has to lead to standardization in cycling data to help out uh, policy makers to make their cycling policy more efficient. So there are a lot of initiatives either on digital twins or on data or on IE, IE uh, uh, processes and knowledge. Uh, so that's why I'm glad to quite often collaborate with Igor and Nick uh, because the scientific world helps out the practical world a lot. Uh, I think I, with this slide, uh, came to the end of the presentation. I would like to already thank you for uh, the attendance. And uh, I now stop share uh, the presentation and uh, give the give the mic back to uh, to Nick van Apeldoorn. Thank you, Joost, for the presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if there are any questions from the audience. These are often a bit of an open debate. So if you have a question, please ask them. If you want to ask them in your chat, rather, you can also put them there and then I'll ask them in public. Uh, it's up to you. But I already see the first hand from Mark. Mark, could you Yeah, please? thank you, Oost, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, um, inspired by the examples you gave, for example, ASML and uh, having electric bikes or uh, normal bikes. I wonder, now, now you presented, you used the digital twin to, um, to analyze you know, uh, uh, how long does cycling take, et cetera. 
But do you know if this is also being used to design, actually? Uh, I am from Eindhoven, Streep, as is not so far from ASML. I don't see loads of bicycles from ASML uh, leaving in the morning to to ASML, but you might use it to, to test scenarios in which you um, actually, uh, I don't know, maybe you can create uh, fast bicycling, bicycling lanes, uh, bicycle parking facilities, and you could explore scenarios probably uh, if it would be worth the investment and what it would mean for mobility. Is is that happening? Yeah, and I have to always, uh, when I'm working with uh, Nick and Igor, I have to always uh, w watch what I'm saying. Um, uh, we developed some models, but they're not digital twin models, but we developed models to uh, evaluate the potential of uh, high quality cycling infrastructure. So what is happening at the moment, uh, we have a specialized model for that. We integrate the model into the digital twin and co uh, and combine that model with data from ASML, but also from from the region. So I think uh, to explain it briefly, it it are all at the moment uh, individual specialized models which are combined and visualized in the digital twin application. So uh, it, it is working, and the interesting part is, but that's a all completely different presentation. Um, is the the accessibility of asml by bike um, and it's on the verge of likelihood of people using the bike so asml is now investing in e-bikes because they also we show them that the not the regular bike asml and the asml uh, plant uh, at the run is too far off for people to use the bike as uh, uh, as an alternative after using the public transport so now they are fully uh, investing on e-bikes uh, for uh, ASML uh, employees. But that I can tell you more about that in a later stage. And what we now are developing, or I am developing with the city of Eindhoven, is uh, the competitiveness between uh, the bike and uh, public transport. So for that, we also use specialized models and try to visualize it um, in the digital twin for people to more easily use uh, the results from the model. Yep. Also, see a hand raised from Peter. And we actually. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's my hand. I have a question because I don't know very much about uh, uh, digital shadows and digital twins. Uh, could you please explain to me uh, once more, maybe, Joost, uh, the difference between the two? Okay, with with uh, I'm going to give the try, and if Nick says I know better, um, he is I think um, or with this invited to interrupt. The the interesting point is that uh, the digital shadow, you have data and you put it in uh, a digital system and you visualize something, but no any there is nothing changing. Uh, so it's more a representation of the the real world, and with the digital twin. Uh, uh, data from the real world goes into a digital twin. Real time. Something, yeah, it can be real time, uh, and something happens. Uh, uh, so there, uh, so it feeds into the real world again um, to to make uh, uh, something happen. And the interesting part is uh, that a lot of digital twins, because the nice thing for presentations is to show really nice maps, uh, but there are really a lot of digital twins we who do not have a great front end, but are working data in and there comes something practical out. So I'm not sure I have to, I will give an example and I hope Nick will um, oh add. Boy. There is a system in the Netherlands and it's uh, uh, affecting the, the, the traffic flows in the city. Uh, so every uh, vehicle from the emergency uh, Agencies, so the, the fire department, police, and uh, the, the ambulances are equipped with sensors. So they drive to the city and they say, I'm a, I'm a fire truck. Uh, then there is a system in the city which says, okay, I'm a traffic light uh, and I'm working as I'm working. And then the, 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 the fire truck comes in and says, I'm a fire truck. And then the, the traffic light says, oh, I know you, you are my friend. And my system says, you get priority. Uh, with that, uh, the, the data from the fire truck is being handled by the digital environment and it uh, g gives priority to the green light. So with that, the system uh, 
uh, optimizes particular uh, things and what we now do and that's uh, the example then uh, it's it's because there is so many much data involved we said but maybe it's interesting to store the data too to make some policy relevant insights so the 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 the, the, the system was not developed to show uh, uh, policy relevant insights it was only to to optimize the operation and now we say okay we also make a representation in maps for policy makers to evaluate if the system they developed is operating well or not or to adjust the algorithms which are being used and now i uh, nick is nodding but normally he's uh, saying i know better so uh, nick i <laughs> hope i did going there <laughs> no, i think you gave a good example so a full digital twin is a closed loop so automatic data goes in automatic action happens and they change something in the real world so that's the ambulance example the fire truck example a uh, digital shadow automatic data goes in and then a human looks at it and makes a decision so that's the big difference well I, th I thought your explanation was perfect uh yeah. i i i i thought maybe we should um uh solicitate uh, solicitere by het journaal <laughs> to be able to explain how a digital twin works <laughs> yeah it's a very good song for journal <laughs> And I also have a question from Cora in the chat. Are you also working close together with Esri? They are working on paid but public entrance to digital twins. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we do not collaborate directly with Esri. Um, and it's not that there is um, any obstruction working with Esri, but uh, uh, they have a different business model and to date, and it's not to say we will never collaborate with them, but to date we collaborate with companies who would really like to collaborate and uh, on knowledge sharing uh, and knowledge development. And th that's something different than building uh, commercial digital twin applications. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And to date, we didn't uh, invest in that. Um, and that's maybe also related to the phase we are in because we are developing uh, many insights which which are not market ready because um, we develop insights which might be interesting for people who are working on the challenge and do not know the question. And I think the tools every builds uh, uh, are already on top of mind and people willing to invest in uh, those kinds of applications. So uh, I think we are more market oriented in developing insights. So, um, but uh, it's not that there is no logical connection between the SRE and uh, the work we do. And if I may add, Nick, because that's interesting, there are people, a lot of people on the LinkedIn who say we build digital twins. Uh, so we have the best digital twin there is, and it's always questionable what the best digital twin is. So for there are, without naming any company, but there are companies who build scenario models, and they say we have the best digital twin ever. And then I think they ignore that the digital twin can be used for historical data, real-time data, for scenario modeling, for all kinds of stuff, but they and I understand the, the 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 position they come from, and they say we have the best digital twin ever. And then already Nick is smiling, but that's well, we have to smile because I think the best digital twin in the world uh, uh, must be uh, developed uh, still. Yeah, so I think I know which company you're referring to. Um, but indeed, it's a challenge. It's a very big challenge. And as she said, it's not one topic that the best digital twin exists. There are often separate twins, as you showed. The question from my side is, you now developed several digital twins. What's your experience after you deliver the project to the clients? What do they do with it? Are they able to use it? Do they use it weekly? Or are there bottlenecks there? Um, oh, there, there are a couple of questions in one sentence. Um, the interesting part is that uh, some of the, for example, the, 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 the crowd safety, uh, digital twin is often used because it's really applicable for all kinds of events in the city. So it's not only King's Day, but it's a, a marathon or a, a big event. So those with a lot of involvement of the, the, the emergency 
organizations they embrace the digital twin uh, for the cycling for example that's my world to say so uh, it's still difficult um, because it's more in the planning process so the, the, the it's less used or less frequently used so for that it's still uh, a lot of ground to gain because it's not so a data-driven uh, uh, reality. Um, and the interesting part is um, cities often do not understand that if they have a digital twin about cycling, a lot of uh, logic is the same for public transport and for car use and for whatever. So what we did is translate uh, GPS data into valuable maps and we did it for cycling and the data also contains walking and car and public transport so um, the, the the added value of the diff digital twin is also in the setup of the build environment on the uh, traffic and transport system so it's easily applicable on other domains so um, uh, it's you can really make easy breakthroughs from for example mobility to environmental impact uh but because uh, their reality also works in silos um uh, the power of the digital twin in combining different domains uh has to be explored still uh, uh by many uh, by many cities thank you i also have another question in the chat now what do the big municipalities and problems already have when it comes to our digital twins that's a broad question, but what do you see, what do you think are the biggest trends in problems? Ah, the interesting part is that uh, for the multimodal transport, uh, there were some big um, innovation programs in which already a couple of small innovations took place for digital twinning. But I think there is a lot of ground to gain. Uh, so that's more on a regional uh, regional level. Um, the crowd safety manager is really interesting for some cities. So the city of Tilburg has the, the fair in the summer. So they have uh, the digital twin. The municipality of Breda uses it for uh, a lot of events. So the King's Day event uh, is uh, really interesting. Carnival is interesting. So from those with the crowd dynamics, uh, the digital twin is important the city of eindhoven is now working on uh, uh, on uh, on the relation with traffic um so that's one um let me think um and what you see on the logistics part there is also uh, 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 some ground being explored with the the the, the, the private logistic companies which have to uh, have to um they have to take some new uh, rules and regulations with the inner city accessibility uh, into account. So they are also interested in new insights. And one of the things I was doubting, but the interesting part is that there is the city management organization. So there are cities in Brabant which have a digital twin, but it's not the, uh, the government itself, but the inner city management uh, organization. So for example, and I'm now sitting in the, in, in the data uh area of Den Bosch. so the intercity management organization of Den Bosch has a digital twin and the city of Den Bosch doesn't have one um, and i can't really explain you why but uh, uh the the stake for the intercity organization with all the shops and all the fuss going in and out of the city is really important for them um so uh, it's both the private as well as the public organizations, which are now uh, exploring uh, the, the power of the digital twin. Did that answer your question? Someone nodding, yes. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Then I have one other question. Uh, I can't I, wait, 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 Nick, because there is one interesting thing, uh, which is from an organizational perspective, really interesting because there is a collaborative platform in Brabant working on cycling. They have a digital twin application on cycling accessibility. And the interesting part is that having one is not automatically 
that everybody knows they have one. So they say, oh, that's really great. Can we have something too like this? You already have it, but uh, so it's also about awareness uh, uh, and about creative uh, uh, processes. So it's having one and applying one is uh, in the other. Yeah, I have a little anecdote on that. Um, one of the biggest urban digital trend platforms in the Netherlands, uh, I spoke with a developer of it, and he said, I estimated 300 of my uh, colleagues would have benefited from it to use it weekly. And then I asked him, how many current users do you have weekly? And it was three. And it would not surprise me if this is the case for a lot of these twins. So I think this making them accessible and applicable is a very big challenge to build these models into adolescence. What do you think on that, Joost? How can we work towards making these things more accessible and really become a product that is useful for planners on a daily basis? Uh, that's, a, that's an easy question to ask and I think difficult to answer. So it's only from my that's perspective easy. then. Yeah. Um, start with the application. Uh, a lot of digital twin discussions start with the data. So which data do we need? How is the privacy uh, regulated? And it's not to ignore the privacy issues or whatever, but it's what is the benefit in your work for from the digital twin? So uh, a lot of, because a lot of discussions start with the data, the end user doesn't understand what the additional value is. So because there is no awareness of the additional value, the use is less. So if you can say with the application of the digital twin saves you uh, 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 20 hours a week uh, of working, then it becomes interesting. But now the discussion is um, we have data and what do you want to do with the data uh, and how is it stored? So the, the, the process ends before the picture. And maybe, the, no, that's not a maybe. That's why I gave my presentation with the end solution because then it's more appealing for people to say, okay, but if you have this, maybe we can build something which looks like it, but it, it answers a different question uh, or something like it. So it's more inspirational uh, in use than, uh, than the data, data discussions, although they are also necessary. But uh, start start with result first. Yeah. GG, I see your hand raised. Yes, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite curious because you just, you mentioned that, okay, digital things is a lot about yeah, data. But you also just said there are some people from uh, Eindhoven University said that kind of what you are doing is not digital things, but digital shadow because uh, that so much data. So so can you elaborate a little bit? What, what is the boundary between the real digital things with data and the too much data that yeah. uh, become a digital yes. shadow? Can I ask where from which organization you are? Oh, uh, yeah. I, somehow I'm not okay. I'm I'm Boas. Uh, I'm a Boas colleague. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the understanding of the crowd, I have a perfect relation with uh, with the colleagues of TU Eindhoven as well from the Breda University. Um, yeah. But it it makes the discussion uh, clean because they say we we have more knowledge and the discussion I'm in with them to optimize the scientific value uh, behind the models and the applicability for the practice. Um, so I think we should not um, burden the people who want to apply the, um, the digital twin with all the technique and all the discussions about the modeling on the back end. So I'm now in a process with the people from uh, from TU Eindhoven, which I do uh, one of the guys is doing a PhD on digital twin development, and I'm in his workshops. And that's also about how to apply the digital twin, uh, having end users to understand the mechanisms and the algorithms, and at the same time, uh, make it applicable. So there is a balance. And I think for many applications, the balance is not uh, there yet. So I think it's good that from a scientific point of view, there is a lot of in-depth uh, analysis and uh, study on digital twins. And at the same time, uh, the, 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 the practical 
practical applicability um, is also helping out uh, building better digital twins. But it's still a work in progress. And I'm not sure if it answers your question, um, but I think there it's it's a bit in the middle. Yeah, thank you, Joost. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I think my camera in uh, some way doesn't work. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. it is. I see you perfectly clear, oh, so no problem. Okay, I didn't see myself. But uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think, yeah, I think um, maybe there's still no very clear answer yet because as you said, digital twin is, um, uh, uh, yeah, a pasta, it's a uh, spaghetti, this everything is mixed in. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this, uh, about this discussion is also that if I talk about the digital twins, the concept, I, I did some uh, uh, social uh, research about how people regard the digital twin, but then the students that I teach also ask me, yeah, kind of, um, can they apply digital twin because it's a popular words to something. Um, and then, then the question is, yeah, you have so so many this kind of smart tools, yeah. Uh, before we have agent-based modeling, these kind of things, and then they also don't know, yeah, what is the difference? For example, uh, to use digital and uh, agent-based modeling to simulate the di uh, dynamics and the digital things and the other things. Uh, so yeah, I, I I'm not expecting an answer, but I found this kind of yeah boundary issues and how to clarify, especially when student wants an answer from you, what will be an uh, yeah a good answer, a clear enough answer to guide the students. Maybe it's yeah. more a question. <laughs> No, Open. maybe maybe Nick can share the, the the roadmap or the bucket list we already developed. Because one of the interesting thing is, if you have a digital twin, you can also apply serious gaming concepts, uh, which which is really, I think, it's there. But uh, then you have to again bridge two domains or twitch two domains who are really closely uh, connected. But there is a lot of ground there to explore still. So uh, I understand your challenge. Um, and that's wh with what I'm started with, that there is a lot of buzz around digital twins and everybody wants to have one. And I, I once said to the uh, elderman of the city of Breda, it's not a pin pinball machine which you buy and they're all flashy lights. And uh, the question is, what do you want to gain uh, with it? So which objective do you have with the digital twin? If, and if there is, no, not one. Um, it's no use of uh, building one because it's then always too expensive. Yes, thank uh, you very much. Uh, I see you on Tuesday. Then we can talk, chat a bit more about it. Yeah, <laughs> also have some ideas. Student for logistics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, time is over. Uh, thank you for your time, Joost. I think it was a very nice presentation. I liked the discussion and. Uh, Thank you for your time.